Uh, welcome back to my channel, uh, and uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, Anime Ham. Uh, this is a CCG, or TCG, uh, customizable card game or trading card game, whichever they those terms are interchangeable. Um, but we are talking about a game that is incredibly uh, different uh, and was very forward thinking um, in terms of creating sort of in, within the card game scope a shared universe. Um, much like you see currently with the MCU, DCEU, attempts to sort of mingle different characters into one universe. This dealt with anime, anime properties, uh, Bubblegum Crisis, uh, Armitage, uh, Dragon Ball Z, etc. Uh, pretty much into one sort of mixed universe for this card game setting, which was great and it was awesome um, and very forward thinking. So uh, I wanted to review this game. Uh, because A, it's a good game and it's very fun, and B, um, you can still find these cards and you can still get them. They're not as easy to access as the last game I reviewed or talked about, which was Overpower. Um, this one is harder to find. Uh, there weren't nearly as many sets, and so, again, it's, it's harder to find. But if you can find it, it's worth it. And it is an incredibly fun game, and so we're going we're gonna to run through it. All right, so the setting for this game... Um, the history-wise, there were three sets, um, and three sets only, and the sets uh, ranged in terms of going from uh, set zero, which had about, I think, six different anime films, uh, properties in, mixed in this game. Then they had a second set, or set one, is what it's commonly called. And then their final set was set two, or just straight Dragon Ball Z, and that's what the property was, all Dragon Ball Z. Um, and so the set was all about Dragon Ball Z, that third one. Now these came out, uh, there weren't issues with production really, they came out on a timely manner, came out pretty quickly. Um, card quality was great, the art, um, the card stock was good. Uh, beautiful card, so again, uh, distribution, production wasn't a problem. Uh, what the issue was that led to a lot of issues or problems with the card, uh, this card game was a, it was a very niche market, uh, meaning that it was not guaranteed to hit everybody, uh, unlike, you know, uh, easy to, to grasp sci-fi or, or Lord of the Rings or comic books or anything like that. So it was a very niche market, which, uh, made it very hard to make this as big as a success as they'd like. Two, uh, which was the real downfall, I think, was the fact that the rules seem to change with every set, um, more changes to the rules. And that is a problem, as you know, if you're, if you're playing a game and you want to have some kind of continuity with each set, changing a bunch of the rules or making variations with, e with each set is not a good idea. <laughs> um, wasn't a good idea. And so that caused a lot of questions and problems with each set. Uh, and the third set, which was the last one, uh, really in many views and opinions was overpowered compared to the other two sets. Um, just way overpowered. In fact, to a point where uh, the third set, while they were, were tournaments running, while the game was active back in the 90s, in fact, the set two, or Dragon Ball Z set, was flat out banned. You, can, you couldn't use any of those cards in the tournament games with anime mayhem that were going on. That's, that's how I'm, difference it was in power level, at least according to their opinions, or the ones making the rules. Uh, so, uh, lots of problems in that regard. Uh, and so uh, after the Dragon Ball Z set, uh, production ceased and um, it had some limited uh, support for a little bit, but then that even ran out. Um, which is a shame, because this game is very different than other games. It allows A, a legitimately built-in solo play mechanism. So you can legitimately, within the already established rules, play this game solo. Which is amazing, and that's awesome. You don't need to find someone else to play this game. You can just put it down, play the game. Um, and that's amazing, and, and that's great. So that's very distinct about that. Um, also, the way the mechanics work, it's designed, it feels much more like a role-playing experience with a card, only in a card game format. 
which is also different. It was great, and it is really, really fun because you get that role-playing experience um, of sort of adventuring, going through the party, and even use a term, party is a term in the game. So it had a role-playing feel to it, which is nice. Um, and again, that art that I mentioned earlier was just really great. Uh, and so that's sort of the history of the game. Uh, if you were an anime fan, then you probably were aware of this game, and it probably uh, was on your radar. If you weren't a fan of anime, then you probably never heard of this game, and it might have just gone over your head, or, or was under the... Uh, you may have just never heard of it. Alright, so the way it works with this game is, like I said, it's more of a role-playing sense. So you're going to pick, you're going to have uh, the main uh, component of the card of the game, the main components, are the character cards. Um, and those are the, again, the characters, the main ones that will be going around, uh, finding items, and, and adventuring, uh, for lack of a better term. So, I'll give an example here of a character card. And I do have Goku, which is really awesome. I love Goku. And with Goku, as you can see, he's got uh, he's got stats here, and then he's got uh, skills, game text, and of course the picture and the name. Uh, sorry, up there. So this is Goku. All right. Uh, and he's one of my favorite characters that I have in the deck. Uh, but there's Goku. Uh, I do have Armitage. Sorry. There's Armitage. I have her. This is a promo card. Uh, the Goku you saw was a promo card. Uh, and the last two are directly from the sets. Uh, but here is, uh, Karai. Those who know Animayam. Um, can correct me on that, how you say that, but I think it's Karai. Um, and then I have Dr. Tofu, uh, an example here. Okay. And then, uh, with the anime, Hems, with the, um, sorry, with the Dragon Ball Z set, he did come out with Super Saiyan cards. Which were really, really powerful cards. This is Super Saiyan Goku. Um, now, uh, those characters, you saw the stats. Now they have, uh, the stats they have again are attack, defense. So attack is the fireball, defense is the shield, uh, movement, which is the butterfly looking icon, charm, which are the lips, and then, uh, energy, which is that, uh, little s sort of star looking, uh, burst looking icon on the bottom there. Uh, that shows what they're capable of doing stat-wise, and then they have, like I said, that box on the top below the picture that are the skills. Uh, and then, of course, if there's any game text uh, on the that lower box, and then, of course, any kind of lore or comment might be in there. Uh, but that outlines what they're capable of doing. The attributes are important because, again, it shows you basically... Hmm. So the attributes are important because it shows you what they're capable of doing uh, for the most part in a combat situation. Um, and then that movement, how far they can move. Uh, skills are what allow you to go through locations to go after items, uh, or, or the term is to scavenge a location uh, to get those winning uh, items that allow you to win the game. Uh, of course, any game, temps, game text to school, uh, such as, uh, I mean, with uh, standard Goku, uh, he has uh, one downfall, he has a minus one. Look on here. He's got a minus one to versus mecha enemies, but he also does not transform when there's a full moon, which most Saiyans have to transform when there's a full moon. Um, so that's an example of, you know, game text uh, that the character has. Um, so, and the defense stat uh, is important because that, uh, in this game, all the stats do their own specific thing. So for defense will also be what's used to calculate your health. So the higher defense, printed defense character has, in turn, the, the, higher, the higher their default health. So, uh, so Goku's a 5. So... So before you do any modifications with cards, um, his defense, his health is also starting at a five because his defense is a five. Um, uh, 
let's see. So that covers basically the character cards. Um, and they are, again, the core. Now you're going to pick four of them, and that's going to be your starting characters that you're going to have uh, ready to go at the beginning of the game. You have four. Now later on, you can you can also you can put additional character cards in your draw deck that you can later on play uh, to add as the gameplay goes to your to your gaming. Um, but that's a choice. You don't have to. In fact, there's some character limitation in the game for how many can be in the field or, or that or this or that. Uh, so you don't want a lot of characters. You just want to have some good select amount that's really going to carry the game. For me personally, I just have the four starting and that's it. I don't have any additional characters. Uh, that's because I think I've built a very solid uh, team that can really last. And so I just need the four. Anyway, you have four starting characters. Now, you also are going to have something called combat cards. And those are these ones right here. Sorry. And as you can see, it's going to have two ends. A, a top end and then another end right here which is uh, has the lip side, I think. Yeah, lip side, and this has sort of a eye of raw eye icon on the top. Uh, so that's uh, these two. Right. Now, the reason they have two different sides is there's two different forms of combat. Um, now, these you do need. You need to have a minimum of 11 uh, of these, at least, with no more than three of any one copy of one uh, to and you have to have that because these will modify combat and you have to draw them when you do that. Uh, again, the sort of the eye of eye, the sort of the eye looking Egyptian eye looking icon on the top right here indicates this side is for the physical combat. And then the lips icon here indicates this is for effects charm combat. Um, and depending on what combat you're in will dictate what end you use, you know, whether it's that end or this end. Um, so the, those are good, and they will have modifications. Uh, they can be good or bad. People, I mean, it's smarter to try and have nothing but just positives. Um, have nothing but good things, uh, just bonuses to whatever you're pulling. Although there are some cards that might be a trade-off. Uh, for example, there's one that I have that's uh, Panic, a minus three defense, but uh, has Enchanted View, which is doubles your charm. So. Some cards are trade-offs, uh, which are will be situational if you want that max benefit on one end. But most of the time, you want to get stuff that's purely on either end going to be a plus or a bonus or a modifier to you that's positive. Um, so those are the combat cards. You're going to have, you know, again, 11 plus of those. And then you're going to have your power cards, which will make up your draw deck. Now, power cards aren't actually an official type in this game. Um, they are merely a a way to categorize into one category um, a number of different cards. So I'll go through those. Uh, one power card type are flash effects, which have the bolt here on the top right hand corner and they're uh, a blue border. And these are the most powerful because flash effects you can play at any time uh, and you just drop it to the effect. So it's really good. Um, so there's that. That's a flash effect. And then you also have, let me pull out the next power card type. All right. You then have these cards with the little chevron symbol on the right hand corner. Uh, some cards will have requirements as this one has. Uh, but these are enhancements. Uh, that's another power card type, enhancements. Those will go directly onto the characters and remains on the character when you play them until the character is killed or bonked uh, or forcefully removed with some other card. So uh, that's the case. Uh, and then another power card type you'll have our uh, equipment, which will have the little wrench icon on the top right hand top right hand corner. Uh, and sometimes you'll have combat stats, which this has attack, defense, and movement, which means uh, this will be, you could act as a, a combat vehicle, which uh, means you can fly around in it, uh, use its combat stats instead of your parties to engage in combat. Um, you know, so it's really good. Now, there's a difference between sets 0, 1, and sets 2. Uh, in sets 0 and 1, the equipment is a brown bordered card, in set two, the anime, uh, the Dragon Ball Z set for Anime Ham, uh, 
they switched the border color for uh, equipment to being blue. So the same border color as the other power cards. Um, so that is one difference to be aware of. Uh, and then the last one, which let me pull up the last uh, card type. Uh, I'm sorry, the last power card type uh, is a global. And that is going to be one that has sort of this uh, sun-looking icon. Come on, focus. Uh, a sun-looking icon right here in the right hand, top right hand. And globals, you put in play, you put them on to, in play on the table, and they will affect your characters only unless it says otherwise. So um, it only helps your characters unless the, the card says specifically, you know, opponent or uh, opponent or opposing characters or some, some kind of text like that, some type or another. So, Anna Mayhem. Uh, uh, so these are the power cards. That will make up your draw deck. Uh, so this, you need a minimum of 20 cards. You need at least 20 cards and that, uh, uh, to make up your draw deck, which are the power cards and or any additional uh, character cards that you want to put in. So a minimum of 20 uh, for that. So those are, the power, those are the power cards. So that's one half of sort of what makes up the bulk of what you're going for. All right. So there we go. Now, the next card type that you need to know about for this game are locations. Um, now, the first location to be aware of are something called havens. And they're right here. And you can tell they're a haven because it has this little castle icon on the right hand side there. And it'll have game effects, uh, game of text. Uh, I have the West Side City Hospital. Uh, you're going to start out with one haven in the game, and most people just use one haven, although technically you could put uh, another, other ones in, um, but I mean, there's no need, there's the only really need one. So, you, you have the one haven, and that serves as basically your little, uh, your little fortress, hence the castle icon. It acts as your little starting point, your little, uh, security safe space area location where you can go back and store items and that's where all your equipment well, unless you have some other card equipment will play to your haven um so it's sort of the uh, uh it's your fortress basically it's where you're going to be protected from being targeted by uh game effects or uh disasters while you're in there again like i said you'll play equipment cards there uh, you'll go back there if you want to just store items um so it's a very important card. So you'll have one of those, and then you'll have seven other locations, uh, which look exactly like the Haven. So this is just a standard location, as you can see. Uh, a standard location card here. Uh, and you can see, because it does not have the castle icon. So this is just a standard location. You're gonna have seven of these. Um, and those locations, I forgot to point out, um, will also have, I'm sorry, uh, there, sometimes there's game text or just lore, but here you have skills, okay? Now the skills are what determine uh, what allows you to scavenge the location. So uh, that one, Mount Muldoon, which I showed you, has climbing or acrobatics or flying. So you need one of those three skills to be able to scavenge the location or, or to go through it and try and get the item that's under there. Um, hence, that's where, again, where the skills come into play that I outlined earlier on the characters. Uh, character cards have skills, that's what you need them for. The skills allow you to go through and, and scavenge those locations. So you need to scavenge them because, again, that's where you get the items that will allow you to win the game. Alright, so you, again, you have, seven, you have one haven and seven standard locations uh, in a deck. And then you're going to have disasters. Uh, sorry, that's the last card type, I'm sorry. And then the next thing after that, which is what you'll put under the locations, after you put the locations down, you're gonna put the items under. And these are your winning cards. These are what are the win markers and what will determine if you win the game or not. Uh, and here's an example of one. This is a, let me see, sorry. This is a sexeroid data disc. 
and it'll say the name of the item here and it'll actually say item and then the name. Uh, but they're also, you can tell because of the border color, it's brown, uh, so it's very different. So it will have uh, maybe a lower icon, a lower text or something, but then it'll also have game text. Um, now, sometimes they don't have game text. Sometimes it's purely lore and it's the items are there purely as a win counter because uh, the way you win the game, you're going to have the first one to collect the majority of the items that are available on the table is the winner of the game. So if you're playing solo, uh, you do need to, then you're going to have seven locations. So you're going to have seven items, one item under each location. So if you're playing solo, uh, a solo game, that means you're going to need to be the first one to get four items to win the game. If you're playing a, a two-player game, you're each bringing seven to the table, so you're going to need to get seven items, the first one to be to get seven items to win the game. Um, and that's how it works with that. Uh, seven items to win the game, uh, if a two-player. Now, for the items, uh, if they have game effects, and most of my items in my deck, I'll be honest, I are items that have some additional game effect with them as well, so that they're so they're helpful in more than just a purely victory sense, uh, pure, more than just purely a victory kind of way. Um, so I have those. Now you have a minimum. You have to bring. Uh, it's not a minimum. I'm sorry. You bring eleven items. So exactly eleven. And you're going to randomly, out of the 11, when you're doing, doing setup, you're going to use 7 of those 11. But you bring 11 items, okay? So, items. 11 of those. Now, the last card, which is the most brilliant kind of card, which really, this card allows the full AI integration system for this card game. And allows you to have truly a solo play mode built into the game. And that are, these cards are... Disasters. Now there are two types. Actually, there are four types. So let me, um, yeah, let me do it this way to show you. All right. So there are four types. Uh, so four sort of subtypes of disasters. Now these disasters are what allow you to go ahead and. Uh, they serve as uh, the impediment to your opponent. So you don't have to worry about, to stop your opponent, you don't have to worry about taking your characters and taking time out of the day to go and attack them. You can do that. You can use your characters offensively versus your opponent's characters, and that's fine. Um, but so that you don't really have to do that, uh, and again, also serving as an, sort of a, a clock AI built into the game if you want to do solo. Uh, so purely genius how they did this. Um, there are these disasters, so I'll show you here. Now, there are four subtypes. I'll show you two, I mean, there are four types of disasters. I'll show you two of the four types with one and then the other two type with another one. So, this is a combat disaster, and you can tell because it has combat stats, attack, defense, and movement, and some will actually have charm as well on there. Um, but this is a combat disaster because you can tell it's got attack, defense, and movement. Um, also, you can tell that this, if you look up here, has a D with an exclamation. So that is a major disaster. Uh, and there are two types, major and minor. And then there, of course, there are combat and non-combat disasters. This is an example of a major combat disaster. All right. And that is the uh, DDJ-1 Battle Mover. Now, an example of the other two possible types, like I said, are non-combat minor disasters. So this is a non-combat because it has no attack or defense. No attack or defense means it's a non-combat. It does have movement, but again, what qualifies for a combat disaster is uh, attack and defense. And as I pointed out, you see this has a D, but no exclamation. So this is a minor disaster. So those are the, f the four different possibilities. Uh, uh, you know, d uh, major, minor, combat, non-combat. Now, these you're going to need at least 20, a minimum of 20, and these are going to be proportional to what you do with your draw deck. <clears throat> and I'll explain that in a sec. Um, but, disasters, and these are great. So these are... 
Um, again, the functionality that allows for a purely one player mechanism, but also impediments, uh, impediments to your opponent's uh, attempts to try and scavenge locations successfully. Because what's going to happen is when you do the setup, like I said, you put one item under all of one item under each of your locations, and then you're going to put these disasters. Uh, you're going to put two of those disasters under each of your opponent's locations. So again, they serve as uh, impediments, things that they have to deal with when they scavenge. Um, so you're going to put two under each of your opponent's locations. Um, and, and that's for a two-player game. Now, in a one-player game, you're going to do the same thing with the items under your locations but you're going to put the disasters under your own locations as well if you're doing a, a solo player game. But if you're doing uh, one on one, or actually this game can do one to five players, so you can have one, three, four, five players, you can have multiple different opponents. But the point is, um, you're going to be um, in, a, in a more than one player game, you're gonna put your uh, disasters under your opponent's locations to serve as an impediment. Now, that sounds a lot like the Star Trek CCG. If anyone's ever played that, who's listening to this video, uh, they had dilemmas, and you put it under your opponent's mission. So a lot of the same concept with that, in that uh, sense. So if you're familiar with the Star Trek CCG from Decipher, uh, first edition, not second, second edition, they changed things, but uh, the first edition Decipher CCG, which I will cover in another video. If you're familiar with that, then you are familiar with the uh, missions and uh, dilemmas kind of thing. It's the same kind of general principle, except for the fact that these are autonomous and they're built in to function where they will encounter anyone that's there uh, and will move along the board if they are come into play, uh, if they have a movement, if they have a movement, um, stat, a, a movement number, then it's going to move along the board. And so anyone who gets in the path of that is going to have to encounter that and deal with that. Um, so it's nonpartisan. Uh, and again, that allows, again, creates that truly one player dynamic that you can do with the game. So um, now, like I said, this is not just put any additional amount you want in there. These are proportional to your draw deck. Uh, so like I said, you start out with 20 uh, disasters, and you're going to have a draw deck of 20 cards. Um, like I said, uh, draw deck of 20 cards, disasters, 20 disasters. Now, for every two power cards that you, for every two additional cards, I should say, I'm sorry, for every two additional cards, whether they're power cards or whether they're uh, additional characters, for every two additional cards that you put into your draw deck, you do need to add an additional disaster. So that's the ratio I was referring to. So you can up the number of cards in your uh, draw deck, but again, consequentially, you will be upping the number of disasters as well. Now in a two-player game, that's fine because you, you're going to throw more at your opponent um, n for the most part. Um, in a one-player game, though, that's going to be more headache for you, so you've got to make the decision. I, I really trimmed down on my deck. I have a 30-card draw deck, so that means I have a 25 uh, disasters instead of 20 in my in my build. And I did that because I, there were some additional cards beyond the 20 that I felt I really needed in there that would make really benefit overall, so I did that. As a result, I've got five more uh, disasters to deal with uh, in any given game. Now, you're going to put two under each location. Now, if you do the math, that you realize that you're going to be, wait, wait, there's going to be six extra because seven times two is 14. So you're going to put 14 of your 20 if you're going bare minimum. I'm like, but again, if you do more disasters like me, that means that I actually have six and 11 left over when I'm done uh, putting the disasters uh, on the table. Um, but normally you're having a six extra. So you ask what is, where those go? Guess what? They go in the draw deck. So that means that you're going to still have that random chance of pulling and activating some kind of disaster that's going to hit the board and start moving or affect people, um, whether it's you or your opponent. So um, so again, it, 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 you are working against your opponent in a two-player game, but at the same time, you're both kind of hoping that you beat the clock or beat these disasters 
and survive, <laughs> quite frankly, uh, uh, in the process at the same time as winning. Because if the disaster is just obliterated, all of you got all of you, uh, all the players, then the disasters win and you're screwed and the game's over. So um, something to think about. But it's and those are the card types. Uh, just give you a rundown on that. Uh, so, in terms of card types and mechanics, uh, is revolutionary for a game. I mean, uh, s card games and CCG, uh, TCGs, I should say, tr uh, customizable card or trading uh, uh, card games or, or trading card games, those customizable ones, TCGs or CCGs, no one had heard up to this point of having any kind of a built-in solo play. No one had heard of that. So that was really revolutionary uh, for uh, you know that market. So it was really great that way. Um, and then also uh, again that the adventuring corner, this adventuring sense that you get with the game. So let me just uh, explain uh, Rundo really quick. So you're gonna have the four starting characters. You're gonna sh you're gonna go ahead and set them aside. You're going to shuffle your combat cards, put them in a pile to, uh, off to the right uh, or to the left, wherever you want to put it, but off to the side. And then you're going to shuffle your draw deck. You're going to shuffle that, draw a beginning hand of seven cards, uh, set those aside, uh, set, uh, set the draw, and then put the draw deck. I usually put it where I'm going to have it during the game. So I just take that draw deck, uh, put it right below uh, next to my combat cards. Uh, combat card pile and I set it there and I go ahead and then do the setup for the game board so uh, I take my haven um, there's also something to note there are two different formats in terms of building the game board and a game board uh, if you're familiar with Star Wars or Star Trek uh, uh, familiar with those you build a game board in other words you build an area or a location with cards that your cards are going to be moving around on so you build this world with the cards that interact with your characters and equipment, etc., etc. That's a game board. Star Trek had it, Star Wars had it, and Anna Mayhem has it. So uh, there are two different schools of thought for those. Uh, the game boards you can either do a, uh, 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 a, a the normal build, which is uh, could be very mixed and very uh, very square or horizontal, or hexagonal. Because the way you do it normally is you take that location card, you put it on the table, then your opponent, or if it's your opponent first, then you, but they put it on the table and you get to put one of your locations anywhere next to and touching that location card. So it could be top, bottom, left, right, uh, any of the corners, as long as they're connecting. And then your opponent gets to it and he can do the same thing anywhere connecting to the what was just put down. So you can get a very convoluted, uh, but a very interesting uh, game board. Uh, however, for solo play, I like to do the straight line method, which is you just take all your locations, put them in one straight line, left to right with the haven uh, just below that, all the way to the right, below the rightmost location. Um, so I, straight line method, left to right. So you'd have the line here, and then you would have my haven right here under this location, and going left like this for the normal locations. Uh, straight line method. But anyway, so you set up the game board, um, and since I do the straight line method, especially, uh, uh, especially on that solo play mode, I'll just take my starting characters, put it under my haven, put my haven on the table right away. Uh, but then I go ahead and get the, the items. Again, you mix those up. Uh, you don't look at them at any time. You mix up those locations, or those items, I'm sorry, put one under each location. Uh, and then again, you still don't look at those items. You, you are not allowed to look at those. You need to make sure it's random and a surprise that you don't know exactly what you're going for. It creates sort of that treasure hunt kind of aspect or, or adventuring kind of sense. But anyways, you put the seven randomly face down under the locations that you've set up. Put those other items aside. Uh, and then you go ahead and put two disasters. And again, in solo, under your own locations in a player versus player under your opponent's locations for the disasters. But you'll put two under each location, uh, and then once you're done with that, uh, once you have two under each location, you, know, you now have the fully set up game board. You're good to go, you take any remaining disasters that you have. So in my case, the, the 11, but normally you'll have six. Uh, you'll have those remaining disasters, 
Then take that draw deck, shuffle those remaining disasters into your draw deck, and you'll have a new draw deck ready to go, and then that's it, you're set up. Now the way the gameplay works is you're going to have the ability to play one of uh, three different card types, uh, and then as many flash effects as you want, but you can play one character, one equipment, and one enhancement every turn, unless you have some card that alters that. Uh, Bulma, for example, allows you to play an additional equipment card each turn. Um, but normally that's what it is. You, and you're just going to play cards each turn, uh, move uh, around this game board, uh, scavenging locations, uh, defeating disasters that you encounter, or going, or you know, working through them until you get those items. And the first one to get, like I said, the majority of the possible items on the board wins the game. Um, any disasters that are carried off by combat disasters off the board are count towards the disasters winning total and you're losing. Um, also any disasters that are discarded or destroyed uh, count uh, against you and towards your disa the disasters. Um, but that's it. Uh, I mean, that's a really brief run through of the cards. Uh, like I said, a brief gameplay run through. I am going to post later on uh, today a video of me playing a solo play of anime uh, of this game, Anime Ham. So you'll be able to see an actual gameplay in solo mode, which you'll see in the video which I'll post. So stay tuned. Um, now my thoughts uh, and my review on the game. I love this game. There's so much rich, uh, the art is great, there's so much rich uh, world building, creative world building in this gaming experience because you're, you have all these anime characters in one world that can interact. You, have, you can have Goku fighting with Armitage or even Goku fighting Armitage if you're fighting your opponent. Um, so much great uh, 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 combination of world building there that's just fantastic. Um, and, and you never know what you're going for because you don't know what's under the locations. Uh, it gives you that exploration sense uh, that Star Trek gave you when you're going under your, uh, under your uh, opponents, when you're attempting missions. But unlike that, um, you don't even know what you're going for with this game. The items, you know there's an item under the, the location, but that's it. You know, that's all you know. So there's a very real sense of exploration in this game of this adventuring is the term I'm looking for, sorry. So it feels like a role-playing experience in so many respects, so many, uh, in so many ways. So I, A, love this game. B, I highly recommend it. It is such a fun game um, and it can challenge. If you build a, a good deck, and I, I love the deck I've built because I've had games where I've been extremely challenged with my own, uh, with what I built myself, challenging myself. Um, but at the same time, I can be just as challenging with my opponent with the same deck. I don't have to make modifications. Um, but it's that sense of adventure. What am I going to find? What am I going to have to encounter and overcome? And you can do this solo. You don't need someone else to play with you. So very effective. Um, just fantastic. I can't, I can't give this game enough praise. Um, now... Like I said, the problems were with the rule changes with each set. Now, personally, it, it seems like a biased opinion that the uh, third set was just flat out more powerful than the original sets. Um, I think that's a bias because I found cards in the original sets that are very powerful, um, extremely powerful. There's one that's the Wrath of the Eye of God. That card flat out, literally you play it and you discard any card that's in play. So someone's Goku, if they're not in the Haven, bam, gone. And he's gonna have to try and get it with once the discard pile recirculates. Um, and that's another thing. This game also uh, allows freedom in terms of your discard pile. With anything that's in the discard pile, if you run out of cards to draw and you need to draw more cards, you just reshuffle your draw deck, uh, excluding items. Items do have to be set aside and remain discarded. Um, but anything but items, you get a reshuffle and draw again. Now, that's a plus or minus because you also are going to reshuffle dis uh, discarded disasters as well. Um, so there's a lot of complex intricacies with this game, uh, with strategy, with card plays. So my bottom line, I highly recommend this game. This game is profoundly fun. It's intricate. It's interesting. The art is beautiful. Uh, card quality is good. Um, 
it's just amazing. And so I recommend everyone uh, go out, find this game. Um, uh, in terms of rules, if you're going off a rule book, uh, you're going to want the Dragon Ball Z rule book. Um, so you might want to buy a, at least a starter of the Dragon Ball Z and then whatever other cards you want from any other set. Or uh, if you just want to buy the cards you want to use uh, from the sets you want, you can find there is an online site that has the most up-to-date anime ham rules, um, the official rules. So I just went and I got the most uh, recent one uh, and I use that and it works great. But if you were to get a rule book from buying a starter, then you would want to get, for the most up-to-date rule book, you would want to get the Dragon Ball Z starter. Um, but just get the most recent um, uh, rule book, uh, get some cards, or even go online for the rule book, but uh, find these cards, uh, put a deck together, and have fun playing the game. Because, again, it's, it's phenomenal. It's a great game. Um, I highly recommend it. Very fun. Um, but thank you for tuning in. Again, Anna Mayhem, uh, phenomenal game, I recommend.